share with you today starts out with a personal experience that then becomes a global experience. I'm sharing it from a personal perspective in the hope that what it will do is put a human face on a topic that is hard for most people to think about. In the hope that it is going to motivate you to want to help with changing the ending of this story. Back in early 1979, I was living in Los Angeles and made an impulsive decision to visit a friend of mine who had just moved to a small town in Pennsylvania. When I arrived, she made a joke about the place she was now living in and said, you know, middle town is really middle town. Nothing important ever happens here. Five days later, one mile from the home in which she lived, the nuclear reactor in Three Mile Island went function. Now, my friends did not have a television set, so for the first day, we did pay absolutely no attention to the story. Second day, I walked to downtown Middletown. I think it had one traffic light there. And there were news reporters and media trucks, and the locals were thrilled with the media attention they were getting. But nobody seemed to think that there was any problem down at the end plan. Third day, I was alone in the house when a loudspeaker came down the middle of the street. Stay indoors and do not go outside unless you have to. Stay away from your doors and windows. Trying not to panic, I ran and grabbed the telephone, but I couldn't get a line because everybody was trying to call at the exact same time. I was alone. I had no transportation. Can you imagine what that felt like? I paced from room to room, trying not to lose it. And then I caught sight of myself in a bathroom mirror. Now, I was well programmed by the Cold War to understand the problems of radiation on the human body. So as I looked at myself, I wondered, am I going to watch my hair fall out? Will I see blisters boil through my skin? Have I already absorbed a dose of radiation so large that I'm functionally dead and I'm going to watch myself die? I truly was at the edge of madness. Then the phone rang. My friends had gotten through. Evacuation was mandatory one mile from the nuclear reactor. That would be us. They drove by, picked me up, and we evacuated to a friend's farm 150 miles away. There we watched television for the first time, Walter Cronkite. It is unnerving to discover that something that happened to you just that morning is the international lead news story of the day. In the evacuation place where we stayed for one week, in that period of time, I ate enough food to gain five pounds and wrote obsessively on a musical as though my sanity depended on it, which it did. On my way back to Middletown, on the way to the Harrisburg Airport, I stopped off at a press conference of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. There, I met a freelance photographer, and I convinced him to take a souvenir snapshot of me at the local hotspot. If you need any evidence, any further evidence that I was out of my mind, this is it. It was still leaking at that time. <laughs> When I returned to Los Angeles, I read an article by Dr. Helen Caldicott, the anti-nuclear activist, where she said that after exposure to low-level radiation, leukemia could show up in five to seven years. Hard tumors in 11 to 15. Chromosomal damage would last forever. A clock popped into the back of my brain in an invisible countdown to what I thought was inevitable cancer. In the weeks and months that followed, I suffered from post-traumatic stress before we even knew the term. I continued eating too much. I drank to excess. I entertained suicidal thoughts while driving. I had a hard time sleeping at night. Every day, I would debate with myself the need to get myself sterilized so I would not give birth to a mutated child. Instead, I made the decision to simply be vigilant and not allow myself to give birth. When Chernobyl happened, I did my best to ignore it because I figured I had one of those suckers malfunctioning just down the block. This was on the other side of the world. What did I have to be afraid of? But in truth, I was as terrified as anybody else, if not more so. It had happened again. Once could be an accident, a fluke, but twice? To gain some control over my life, to gain some control over my life, I started reading everything I could on cancer prevention. In the process, I changed my diet, switched completely over to organics, took fists full of vitamins that I swallowed with filtered water. I saw only holistic health practitioners. And still, the clock in my back and the back of my brain kept ticking down to cancer. Well, as the years passed, 
I was able to get on with my life, and you know, I'm in faded from daily consciousness for me. And the cancer clock did run down with no leukemia, no tumors. But as I entered my mid-40s, I began feeling tired all the time, and nobody could figure out what the problem was. Then just two years ago, I read a book on adrenal fatigue. It is a progressive problem based on stress. The adrenals get triggered into fight or flight and don't have a chance to recover before they are triggered again and again. A single major stress event can set a person up for adrenal fatigue. The book asks, when was the last time you can remember feeling completely well? My answer, right before Three Mile Island, more than 30 years before. It seems that that single event set me up for decades of progressive adrenal depletion to my current state of exhaustion. Fortunately, I have found holistic practitioners and have been able to find my healing on that issue. And then, Fukushima. 9.0 earthquake, 45 foot tsunami, three nuclear reactors on the Japanese coast, all of them inundated by floodwaters, cooling systems destroyed, meltdown in three reactors, radiation release, then explosions, more radiation shot up into the upper atmosphere, into the jet stream, into the air, into the seawater, on the ground. Absolutely no containment. Every fear I faced as a result of having been at Three Mile Island reactivated. I had trouble sleeping, so I kept a computer next to my bed. And every time I woke up, I would Google for new information. In the beginning, there was a story of a radiation plume coming towards the United States, set to hit us eight days after Fukushima began. And then the story disappeared from mainstream media, amongst official reassurances that there was no plume, there was no danger from radiation because radioactive iodine has a half-life of only eight days. And it's been more than eight days, so there is no problem go about your lives. This I did not believe, and here's why. Half-life refers to the period of time that it takes for a radioactive isotope to become half as volatile as it is to begin with. But it is still radioactive. Experts agree that in order to find out how long it takes for a radioactive substance to become completely inert, you have to run it through at least 10, if not 20, half-life cycles. So for the sake of argument, let's take the smaller number and multiply by 10. So here we have radioactive iodine, half-life eight days, radioactive life, eight days. That's different. Then there's cesium. It has a half-life of 30 years, a functional radioactive life of 300 years. Then there's plutonium. There's a reason why it was named after the devil. No, it's not named after Disney's big yellow dog. Plutonium is the most dangerous substance on Earth with a half-life of 24,000 years, which means multiply by 10. It really needs the 20, but for the sake of argument, we'll keep it at 10. 240,000 years of radioactivity. All three of these isotopes, as well as others that are not tracked, were all exploded at Fukushima and are in the upper atmosphere circling the Earth. <coughs> Now, the early signs of mutation are showing up in Japan already. This is from a news video that appeared about three months after Fukushima happened. It's a bunny rabbit that was both conceived and born after the accident. Note that it has no ears. This is from a uh, photo series of shots from a single garden near Fukushima, a rose within a rose. Every last one of the shots in this sequence show some form of genetic mutation. Meanwhile, in the United States, we have no idea of how much radiation actually came our way. Because in the wake of Fukushima, in a completely counterintuitive move, the United States government stopped doing radiation monitoring, for the most part, and there are no official figures out. Citizen activists with Geiger counters have stepped forward and have registered radiation spikes in the Pacific Northwest, and elsewhere around the country. The University of California at Berkeley Department of Nuclear Engineering has been testing organic milk in the, from the San Francisco area. And they have been discovering radioactive cesium in this milk in alarming levels as recently as late September. There are many other examples, too many to mention here. 
But the problems we face here in the United States do not just come from Japan. In the United States right now, there are 104 nuclear power plants. Of those, of those 23 are GE Mark I reactors, the exact same model that malfunctioned in Fukushima. These reactors were built to have a functional life of 40 years. Most of them are over 30 years old now. Yet, their owner operators are petitioning, and in most cases getting, 20 year extensions on their licenses. Even though it is known that containment structures decay from the constant bombardment with radiation, making them progressively less safe the older they get. In addition, the United States currently has more than 75,000 tons of radioactive waste stockpile and no way to safely store it or render it inert and neutral. Spent fuel ponds and dry cask containers are temporary measures at best. They will not take care of the materials for the life of radioactivity. Remember, 240,000 years. In addition, all of this is regulated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Despite its official sounding name, the NRC receives 90% of its funding from the nuclear industry. That's right, they are paid by the industry that they are supposed to be regulating. The NRC makes all of its safety decisions based on a statistical cost-benefit analysis. And as we have recently learned, in this computer program, they value human life at a lower level than any other federal agency. I think now would be a good time for everyone to take a nice deep breath. I know how frightening this information is. It can tr trigger us into adrenal, not just fight or flight, but freak or freeze. I know in the wake of Fukushima, when I was first learning this information, I was in a tremendous amount of fear until I realized that what I had to do was take action, to take the energy of that fear and turn it into something that would have some positive good. So what I have done is produce a weekly podcast on nuclear issues to not only take information in and get it out to maintain my balance, but to give other people the opportunity to learn for themselves what is going on so that they can make an informed decision. So here we are with all this information, fight, flight, freak, or freeze. I propose that there is a fifth option. One that has the potential to get us out of the nuclear corner into which we have painted ourselves. It is a four-part program. The first part is begin immediately a phased plan shutdown of nuclear reactors and a dismantling of all of the plants, a process that will take a minimum of 10 years. In the process, we're going to have to find ways to store the material. Every day, every one of those 104 nuclear reactors in the United States and all the others around the world are generating more and more nuclear waste that we do not know how to store and we do not know how to neutralize. At the same time, each of these plants is vulnerable to acts of God or nature, operator error, or terrorism. In the last three months alone, the Fort Calhoun nuclear reactor I guess this is more than three months, but since last summer, the Fort Calhoun nuclear reactor in Nebraska on the base of the Missouri River was surrounded by floodwaters from the Missouri. That's a nuclear power plant seen as an island. It was protected only by an eight-foot inflatable berm. And that berm at one point was deflated when a backhaul operator backed into it and dinged it. <coughs> Fortunately, they got it reinflated in time. Not too much flooding took place at the plant, and they were able to get it cleaned out. Or we might have been facing the equivalent of Nebraska Shima. This past August, the 5.8 earthquake <coughs> on the East Coast, the epicenter was less than 10 miles away from the North Anna nuclear reactor. This quake shook the two reactors that are in North Anna to almost twice their design specifications. These reactors are both over 30 years old. Would you trust a car that was 30 years old that had been in an accident? And yet, the owner-operators are petitioning to get North Anna put back online, and the NRC has not yet made its safety decision. So I return to my initial point, shut down the reactors. So if we do that, what are we going to do for energy? I propose that we begin immediately 
a Manhattan Project for Alternative Energy. Now, the original Manhattan Project created the atom bomb in just over five years, started from nothing to completed bomb, five years. It had the complete support and funding of the United States government. In the process of this creation, it, it created over 130,000 jobs at a cost of $2 billion, approximately equal to $24 billion today. So where's this money going to come from? Right now, the current administration has earmarked $8.3 billion in loan subsidies to loan guarantees for the building of two new nuclear reactors in Georgia. What if instead we took that money and applied it to those people who are already creating clean, green, sustainable energy? I'm not talking about a big top-down bureaucracy. I'm talking about giving it to the people who are already doing the work. We wouldn't be starting from scratch. The technology already exists. Prototypes exist for solar, wind, geothermal, tidal, and other forms of energy. With an infusion of cash, we could create manufacturing, we could underwrite manufacturing, end user subsidies, and infrastructure, and at the same time, provide training for nuclear workers who are going to ultimately be outsourced from the jobs that they have. If we did all we could to support the Manhattan Project for Alternative Energy, where could we be five years from now? In the meantime, we must conserve energy. In Japan, after Fukushima, the government made the call for a 15% a reduction in energy, and they got it virtually overnight. Here in California, we get only 15% of our energy from the nuclear power plants in Diablo Canyon and San Onofre. With the setting of an intention and the follow-through of taking action, we could cut our energy usage just by taking away the frivolities and, and the redundancies. And that way, we could do without the energy from these two power plants immediately and set a model for the rest of the country. While all of this is going on, we must protect our health. There are supplements that can leach radiation out of the body and others that will help support our immune system so that we can resist the influence and the impact of radiation. Similarly, there are soil amendments we can put in the ground that will attract, hold, leach, and fix the radiation so that it is not taken up into plants and from there into the rest of the food chain. We must protect the food chain. All four of these things must be done at the same time if we are to have any hope of succeeding in this plan. If we do not get leadership from top down, then it's time for us to take it from the grassroots up. And as the current Occupy movement is showing, that's not necessarily a bad strategy to follow. This is the program, and we need to follow it. If you think not, consider this. San Onofre is less than 80 miles from where we are gathered here today. So imagine if you Earthquake, 7.1 or higher. San Onofre is only built to withstand a 7.0. It's on the ocean less than four miles away from an active earthquake fall. What's happening? What do you do? Fight, flight, freak, or freeze. None will make you safe. This program is the only thing that will. Earth is a rock in the middle of a bubble in the middle of nowhere. What happens on Earth stays on Earth. I believe with all my heart that we can turn this around, but only if we set an intention and we take the action. I never want you being in the same position I was in at Three Mile Island with a nuclear nightmare just down the block, and you need to take action for your children and their children and their great-grandchildren, because what is at stake is nothing less than the future of life itself. Thank you.